All right, before I get into what I want to talk about today, which is <laughs> I want to dispel the myth today of the, <coughs> the finding of the one, right? As though there is one person for you. And I just want to show you from the Bible that that's not the case. But um, that's what I'm going to be talking about today, finding a spouse and I've called it the one. But before I get into that, the question came up last week of, you know, what's the difference between being engaged, being betrothed, being espoused, being married, and, and, and what is a concubine? So I'm not 100% sure, but I just want to show you some verses and just give you an idea of what I think is the difference. Um, so first of all, engaged, I believe, is like a modern day concept. It's not something we see in the Bible or what we would think of engaged and fiancés in today's day. I don't believe it's something that God uh, would have us do. Um, I don't even think it's, it's something, yeah, it's not, not something in the Bible at all. It's just something, it's not necessarily wrong. It's just something, it's a concept that is man-made. It's not something that's um, in the Bible. So... A couple of points I've got here about uh, being engaged in the modern day man-made concept type of way is it's a covenant between two singles uh, to one day be married. Now, the father of the bride can still veto this covenant, right? Because a woman cannot make any covenant without her father's permission. Um, but if her father allows that covenant to pass, then I think it would be wrong for the father to then not allow her to get married. Because if he's allowed his daughter to make a covenant to promise another man that one day they will get married, if he then later on says, well, actually, no, I'm not going to let you get married, he would actually be in the wrong because now he's causing her to sin because that covenant actually went to pass because he allowed it to begin with. So it's still a sin to break this promise, but... In, in the modern day concept type of engagement, it's not adultery because you're not married. You're just two singles that have made a promise to each other. No different to two friends that have made a promise to each other to do, to do something, right? So if you break that promise, it's still a sin. It's just that if you break that promise and marry somebody else, you're not committing adultery because there is no obligation there. Um, well, there is an obligation to get married, but it's not considered marriage. And the other thing is with the modern day concept, man-made concept of engagement is... Any intimacy between these two singles is considered fornication. So it would be wrong because you're still single. Uh, you're not married. You've just made a promise to each other to one day get married. Now, how is that different to betrothal and espouse? And I think, in my opinion, to be betrothed and to be espoused is really two ways of saying the same thing. Um, I, I think the Bible uses these terms sort of interchangeably to talk about the same situation between uh, two, a, a, a man and a wife. But basically, from what I can tell in the Bible, uh, to be betrothed or espoused is a covenant uh, between a man and a wife, but they are considered husband and wife. So they are technically married uh, in, in a covenant aspect, but they have not yet come together physically. And I think we can see that in a couple of verses here. So it's a covenant where the couple is considered husband and wife, but have not yet come together physically. And I've just first gone here to Deuteronomy 20 verse 7. It says here, and what man is there that hath betrothed a wife? So you can see there that it's a wife and is betrothed to her. Um, it says, and hath not taken her, let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. So this was the instruction given before the war saying, you know, if you come out to fight, there are certain things that say, hey, if you haven't done these things, you know, don't, don't risk your life, go back and complete them. And, and one of them was this, is that if you had betrothed a wife, and hath not taken her, let him go and return unto his house, lest he die in the battle and another man take her. So you can see there that he's betrothed to this woman, but he hasn't yet come together. And I'll show you a couple of other verses that would support this too. Another one here is Deuteronomy 28, uh, verse 30. Thou shalt, this is a judgment that God is saying uh, when it comes to the blessing and cursings in the old covenant. He's saying here, thou shalt betroth the wife and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build an house, and thou, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. So we see here that you know, you've betrothed a wife, you're engaged to her in the biblical sense, because this is the, the real type of engagement. The biblical engagement is betrothal or espousal. He says you're going to engage a woman to be your wife, but you're not going to be able to lie with her. 1 Samuel 18. Now, the espousal and betrothal happens at the time when the dowry is paid. And I just want to share with you this uh, quite odd story. This is one of those stories in the Bible that sort of makes you cringe. But we need, to, we need to realize when we read this, this is not something that God asked them to do. This is just something that Saul, I guess in his sick mind, uh, asked David to do. But it says here in 1 Samuel 18, uh, verse 25, And Saul said, Thus shall, thou, thus shall ye say to David, the king 
desireth not any dowry, but an hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. But Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. And when his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law, and the days were not expired. Wherefore David arose and went, he and his men, and slew of the Philistines two hundred men. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full tale to the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law, and Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, to wife. So this is one of these stories you just kind of think, what, what a weird request of Saul to ask, because you know, it makes me think, like, who went and collected all these foreskins? How did they store the foreskins? And then who went and counted them later? Because it says here, he gave them in full tale to the king. So somebody obviously counted them to make sure that there were, you know, 200 foreskins there. Um, that's kind of gross, but, you know, th this just shows the depravity of men. But the point I, I wanted to show you that, because see, instead of a dowry, Saul asked for 100 foreskins of the Philistines. And I wanted to sh uh, just compare that to uh, 2 Samuel 3 verse 14, where David says later on, he says, And David sent message, messages to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Deliver me my wife Michael. Because this is the reason why he went and um, got those foreskins and went, got this dowry because he wanted to marry Saul's daughter, Michael. <coughs> says, Deliver me my wife Michael, which I, look, I espouse to me for an hundred foreskins of the Philistines. You see that that espousal there is the betrothal, the engagement, but he has not yet taken her, right? That's why he's saying, deliver me my wife that I've espoused to me for a hundred foreskins of the Philistines. Uh, let's go to Matthew 1. The other situation we'll see is between Mary, the mother of Jesus, and uh, Joseph. And we'll read here from Matthew 1. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, <coughs> when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So there you see, they were espoused and they had not yet come together. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. So you can see that they're, they're, they're espoused, they haven't come together, but Mary is considered his wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. This is a good verse to show the, the deity of Christ. Then Joseph, uh, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So you can see there that I believe it's saying he, he then went and, and did as the angel had, had said to him. He took his wife, but then he didn't, I guess, take her. We, we're told in verse 25, he didn't physically take her until after she had brought forth her firstborn son, which was the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, this also shows that the doctrine in Catholicism of uh, Mary being a perpetual virgin is false. Because it says here that he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, saying that he did know her after she had brought forth her firstborn son. He had took her and married her. Um, I'll just uh, turn quickly as well to Luke 2.5. <coughs> Luke 2.5 says here, he says it to be, they're, they're now moving back to, I believe it's, uh, I can't remember where they went, but to, to be taxed. Um, he's going back to his home, home, home city, uh, Joseph. He says, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. So I think the Bible makes it a point there in Luke because we're not given that story of, you know, the angel coming to Joseph and, you know, him finding her with child and all that. So the Bible, I believe, is making a point there to say that Mary is his espoused wife as opposed to just wife because then it could, she could be married, she may not be a, a virgin, where it's saying here that she's still a virgin, they are, married, they are espoused, but they have not yet come together. <clears throat> Matthew 5, 31. Now, with espousal and betrothal, it's not the same as engagement, because remember we said that if you break an engagement, you're sinning. Um, but you're not committing adultery. Whereas it, with betrothal and espousal, if you break that covenant, you are committing adultery. So there's a big difference there. Um, so 
the covenant of espousal and betrothal can only be broken in a lawful divorce. Um, and it says here in Matthew 5.31, Jesus says here, It being said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery, and whosoever shall marry her that is, uh, that is divorced, committeth adultery. So you can read more. I won't go into this in this sermon. I'll preach about this another time. But if you go to Deuteronomy 24, you can read about that example. And we see another example of it with the example of Mary and Joseph. But the point I just wanted to make is that with espousal and betrothal, it's different to engagement because if you break that covenant and you go and marry somebody else, you are actually committing adultery if that covenant is not broken lawfully, which is saving for the cause of fornication. Now let's go to Deuteronomy 22. I just wanted to show you here that God does actually treat espousal and betrothal with the same seriousness. Um, I'll just read here in Deuteronomy 22. If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto a husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her. Then ye shall bring them both out, of the, out unto the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city, and the man, because he had humbled his neighbor's wife, so thou shalt put away evil from among you. So again, the consistency in verse 24, we see here that a woman that is, a, that is betrothed to a man is the man's wife. Because he's saying there, you lie with a woman that's betrothed, You've humbled your neighbor's wife. And you can see there that the penalty for sleeping with a married woman is the same penalty with sleeping with a betrothed woman because she's technically, like, they're, they're together in a sense, they're husband and wife. It's still sleeping with a man's wife and God treats it with the same severity. Now, you might ask the question, well, if, you, the, if it's the death sentence for adultery, and, um, and or sleeping with a married woman or sleeping with a betrothed woman, then why is there a bill of divorcement, right? Because then how can it, because then why, if, if, she's, if the husband has found some uncleanness in her, isn't that the death sentence, right? Why, why is there a bill of divorcement? You ever wondered that? Well, the reason is, I'll just show you here, um, Deuteronomy 19. There's an important principle when it comes to the death sentence we see here in Deuteronomy 19. It says, one witness shall not rise up against a man for any iniquity or for any sin. In any sin that he sinneth, at the mouth of two witnesses or at the mouth of three witnesses shall the matter be established. If a false witness rise up against any man to testify against him that which is wrong, then both the men between whom the controversy is shall stand before the Lord, before the priests and the judges which shall be in those days. And the judges shall make diligent inquisition and behold, if the witness be a false witness and hath testified falsely against his brother, then, ye, then shall ye do unto him as he hath thought to have done unto his brother. So shalt thou put the evil away from among you. And those which remain shall hear and fear and shall henceforth commit no more any such evil among you. And thine eye shall not pity, but life shall go for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Now I'm not preaching about the death sentence today, but I just wanted to show you here that's why um, it's not an automatic death sentence if somebody's found with uncleanness or found with child because you need two or three witnesses, people that actually catch them in the act, to sentence people to death. It can't just be hearsay, right? That's why it's the mouth of two or three witnesses, people that are actually seen. And the seriousness of it here is because people will say, well, what if two or three people just get together and then just testify against somebody and they're found guilty? Well, the risk there is is that if you try and get somebody killed and the judges make diligent inquisition and find you to be a liar, you're going to get killed. Because whatever you wanted done to that person and you're a false witness, that's what's going to get done to you. And the Bible says here, don't even pity them. You know, when they say, oh, I'm sorry, I made it up. I, you know, I repent, I lied. He says, don't even pity them. Because we want to stamp out this sort of activity in society, people falsely accusing each other and falsely witnessing against each other. So it puts that in perspective that people cannot just bring somebody to the judge and just get people put to death because they're risking their own life. And it also puts Jesus' trial in perspective because the people that were falsely witnessing against Jesus, what should have happened to them? They should have been put to death. 
right? When they were found, because remember their witnesses didn't line up one against another. At that point, they should have been guilty uh, and, and, and put to death. <clears throat> so that's why, um, you know, when a woman is found with uncleanness or adultery happens, there are these other laws to deal with it in the Bible and not necessarily always the death sentence because you need those two or three witnesses. Because, you know, the husband could be lying. Because it could be the husband, right? It could be the husband that, that made her have the child. And then now he just doesn't want it. And he, he's accusing her of adultery. So uh, that's why um, that's in place. So that is the difference, I believe, with betro betrothal and espousal versus what we would in a modern day concept and a man-made concept of engagement. And to be honest, it's probably a much better practice. Because I, I don't know why. I mean, I'm still looking into why maybe Joseph and Mary... Uh, delayed it so long where they were in a situation where they were espoused and they had not yet come together. It might be that very shortly after, and this is just a thought I'm having and I, I might preach on this at Christmas time, but j just the thought I had was, you know, it might have been very shortly after um, they had been betrothed and espoused that the angel came to Mary and she was told she was, she, she was going to conceive. Because after the angel came, if you know the story, and, um, and told her that she was going to, kind of, going to conceive the Lord Jesus Christ, she then went to visit Elizabeth, who was six months pregnant with John the Baptist, and she stayed with Elizabeth until Elizabeth gave birth to John the Baptist for three months. So it could be, this is what I think, you know, the, the angel came, told her about you know, being conceived. They had just shortly been betrothed, so that's why they hadn't come together yet. Then she went to Elizabeth's house for three months, Right to help her with that, and then when she came back to Joseph, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost, and that's and then then the angel came to Joseph and told him all that, and then he decided, you know, like the angel had said, you know, not to know her until after she had given birth to the Lord Jesus. So maybe it was only a bit more than nine months that they had not come together, but there was specific reasons why they did it. Whereas, you know, like we talked about last week, there really is no good reason to delay that. But if you do for whatever reason, you know, let's say you need to organize a wedding, you know, maybe they need to organize a marriage supper and get, get the party together and get the servants together. And, you know, maybe they want to invite people, you know, maybe they're betrothed, but, you know, they want to invite their friends. And it's not just like getting on a plane and flying to Jerusalem or flying to Nazareth. It's like they have to, you know, get their camels ready and come across for the party. So, you know, there's all these things that, that these factors that might come into play of why this delay has happened. And maybe you guys can think of others. I'm just thinking of these on the spot. But my point is, maybe that's a better way to practice uh, dating and husband and wife rather than two singles being engaged, but rather the covenant being realized that, hey, you are now husband and wife and we're just delaying the ceremony of when you come together and be married because then the temptation is gone, right? Meaning if, if you cannot contain yourself until that day, you're not fornicating anymore because you're husband and wife. You could you know, do whatever you want technically, but you might just want to make that day special, you know, and, and wait till that day where you have the ceremony and come together and, um, you know, that, that be that date. So I, I do think it's a better practice, um, but, you know, whether that's going to change, you know, maybe, maybe with us it can change. With our children, you know, we can start betrothing people and espousing people rather than singles just getting engaged and getting into all this trouble and fornicating and, and, and not walking right with the Lord. So the last situation, obviously, is married. You know, what's the difference? Well, it's basically, like, if I haven't got it already, it's espousal and betrothal, but the people have come together. And, and really, that's why I think it's called marriage, because, you know, when you marry things together, you're joining them together. And that's why the two becoming one flesh is referred to in the Bible as marriage, because that is the two people coming together as opposed to just the covenant and the promise of betrothal and espousal. <clears throat> Last point on this uh, very long offshoot, Judges 19. I just want to address the topic of uh, what is a concubine. Now, I'm not 100% sure what a concubine is, but somebody gave us a thought last week, I can't remember who it was, um, that said, you know, is it, is it like a servant uh, person, like a servant girl that is not free, uh, who is married to her master, as opposed to a wife who is a free woman who is married to her husband? So maybe that's why, you know, the Bible does mention concubines and mention wives. Um, but, you know, that, that, that makes sense to me, you know, uh, that a concubine is just a, a, a not a free woman who is married to a, to a, a man. But it's, see, I don't believe that a concubine is just a, what, what a, lot, a lot of people would say, a live-in girlfriend, like somebody who's just a girlfriend, you're both single, but you're just fornicating and you're living together. 
I don't think that's what a concubine is. That's just two singles fornicating. Whereas a, a, a concubine in the Bible is referred to as somebody's wife or the, the man of a concubine, we see here in Judges 19, is referred to as the concubine's husband. And that's just what I wanted to show you here. It says here in Judges 19, And it came to pass in those days where there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite sojourning on the side of Mount Ephraim who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. And his concubine played the whore against him and went away from him unto her father's house to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there four whole months. Now look here in verse 3. And her husband arose. So these are not just boyfriend and girlfriend, they're two singles. It's, the man is referred to this, concubine's, uh, to this concubine as her husband, right? And it's emphasized in this as well. He says, And went after her to speak friendly unto her and to bring her again, having his servant with him and a couple of asses. And she brought him unto her father's house. And when the father of the damsel saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. And his father-in-law, so the, even the father is, is referred to that man's concubine as a father-in-law. The damsel's father retained him and he abode with him three days. So they did eat and drink and lodged there. And it came to pass on the fourth day when they arose in the morning that he rose up to depart. And the damsel's father said unto his son-in-law, comfort thine heart with a morsel of bread and afterward go your way. Now this can't be just a case of them referring to each other as husband and wife because this is actually the narrator of the story, which, is, which we believe is the Holy Ghost, referring to this man as this concubine's husband. So if that's the case, then I don't believe it's just the case of them being a living girlfriend. It, it is actually husband and wife, but for some reason the status of a concubine is different to that of a wife, otherwise they would just be referred to as the same thing. So there's a couple of thoughts there. I hope that clears up a couple of things. And maybe you guys have some thoughts too. So that's the difference, I believe, between what we would call engagement, betrothal, espousal, married, and a concubine. All right, Proverbs. <clears throat> okay, so what I want to just dispel this morning, just talk about this morning, is this concept of finding, you know, the one, as though, like, there is one person out there for you and this idea of a soulmate that you're seeking to find. And, you know, this, this idea, you know, it sells movies. You know, it's, it's, a great, it's a great story in Hollywood, but it's not biblical, you know, and it's not something that we should buy into as though there is this one person and, and how do we find out who this person is? The Bible says here in Proverbs 18.22, it says here, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing and obtaineth, favor of the Lord. Now, before I get into the one, one thing I just want to mention here for us guys and girls is, you know, when the Bible says, whoso findeth, whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord, this tells me that a wife needs to be found. A wife's just not going to just come along to you, right? So I don't buy into this, this whole spiel that you hear in a lot of churches of, you know, um, what do they say? You know, God, you know, you'll hear people when they give their testimony about how they met their wife and they're just like, oh, God just brought her along to me and I just didn't have to do anything. She, I, just, I just prayed and she just came along and, you know, I do not buy into that for one second, you know, because, you know, the Bible, first of all, says you need to find a wife. And second of all, even if, you know, I could give you the fact that maybe God crossed your paths, but you still had to do something. Like, you still had to say hello. You still need to get to know her. You still need to make the decision to approach this lady. Or even if she said hello to you, to talk to her and, and get to know her and, and bring it to that point where you're actually talking about marriage. Like, these things just don't happen. Like, finding a wife just doesn't just happen and two people just, oh, we just happen to find ourselves married one day. No. <laughs> like, there's a decision process that, that comes into play. And, you know, people that say, oh, you know, I just prayed and prayed and prayed and God just brought her along. You know, I don't, I don't buy that. Yes, will God help you? Will God give you the confidence? Will God give you the courage? Will God bring women into your life? Yes, but will he make you take that step of faith and go talk to her? No, that's something that you have to do. You have to go out and seek that wife and find it. Now, you know, it might apply to a girl. So I'd say, you know, maybe, you know, that's why it says, whosoever findeth a wife findeth a good thing, because generally it should be guys going and finding that wife. So I think it can apply to a girl where they're just praying and trusting in God and a guy just comes along and approaches her and wants to get to know her and ends up marrying her. So yes, that can happen to a girl. I don't believe it applies to men. <clears throat> you know, it's a bit like Calvinists that just won't admit that 
that their works start with a decision. Have you ever talked with a Calvinist and they, and they just won't admit that they have a decision to make in order to serve God? I, I, like a lot of Calvinists I talk to, they're just like, you know, I don't know, like, I, it's not me. God, God just, you know, he's just, he's the one that gives me this desire and he just, you know, I, I just let Christ lead and, and God just makes me do these things. And, and it's trying to get a Calvinist to admit, no, like you went to church this morning because you decided to get up and go to church this morning. But it's, it's, it's kind of like that situation where, you know, trying to get people to admit, hey, it's, it's not just God. There, there, there is a, a, a part for you to play in order to find this wife. <clears throat> So, you know, this, this, means, this means if you have to find a wife, this means it takes work, right? For guys especially. It's going to take work. It's going to take, you know, uh, endurance sometimes. It's going to take patience, meaning, you know, you might get rejected and you might have to try again. It's going to make you more of a man. Um, it's going to take some heartache, right? Because with choice and with finding a wife, it means that you're not going to always win. Um, it's going to take disappointments and it's going to take prayer. Um, if you're going to find this wife that God would have you to marry. Uh, let me show you this verse in Proverbs. Because finding somebody that is worth marrying is, is not easy. Look at what it says here in Proverbs 20 about a man. Most men will proclaim everyone his own goodness. So he's saying everyone's going to talk about how good they are themselves, right? But a faithful man who can find. So it's saying here everyone thinks they're good, everyone's going to say they're good, but somebody who is actually faithful and good it's not easy to find. Now this phrase here is not saying that it's impossible to find, meaning that it is possible to find a faithful man, it is possible to find a, a virtuous woman. This phrase is not saying, you know, who, who can find, meaning it's impossible to find. I believe it's just saying that it's difficult to find. And I think I can prove that by going to the virtuous woman passage, because we see this same phrase where the Bible says, who can find a virtuous woman? So he's saying, is it impossible to find a virtuous woman? No. He's saying, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies, so she's very valuable. Look at the next verse. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. So somebody found her, right? Because she's married. So it's not impossible to find this woman. It's just that uh, it's not easy sometimes to find a virtuous woman. <clears throat> so it's going to take some work. It's going to take some work. You know, and, and for those of you who are single, you know, if you want to uh, find somebody, you know, don't be a hypocrite. If you want to find a virtuous woman, you know, be a faithful man. And if you want a faithful man to approach you, be a virtuous woman. Now, some tips, especially for the girls. I just got three tips that I've written down here. <coughs> Let's go here for this, Timothy. <laughs> okay, number one is, you know, make it known that you are, my first tip is make it known that you are available and wanting to marry. Because, you know, often uh, ladies are a bit scared to let people know that they're looking for a husband or, you know, maybe pride can kick in and they don't want people to know that they're looking. Because why? Because people who are of the world, people who don't have the same understanding that we do and have compassion on people that want to follow God's will, which I'll get into in a moment, will we'll say, oh, you know, you're, you're desperate, you're clucky. So a lot of uh, ladies will be scared or be too proud to let people know that they're available or that they are wanting to marry. You know, there's nothing wrong with wanting to be married. So don't let these insults of being desperate or I don't know what, they, what else they call people, desperate or um, clucky. These are the ones I can think of, you know, where you want to be a mother, you want to be married. Look what it says here in 1 Timothy 5. Paul is saying here to, to the women that are not married, or have been, have been uh, widowed in this instance, so they, they are unmarried. He says here, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adver adversary to spe speak reproachfully. Now, the, is there any confusion about this verse? There's no confusion about what God wants for a young lady. But how many young ladies in Christian churches these days are saying, I don't know what God's will is for my life. I don't know what God wants me to do with my life. What, what is the will of God for me? When it's, when it's written in plain, plain English right here, it says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Right? As though if you don't do these things, the adversary is going to say you're doing the wrong thing. Right? Now, you, knowing this verse is in the Bible, 
When somebody calls you desperate or calls you clucky, now you should, you should wear that as a badge of honor, right? Because the fact that they identify that you want to be married, that you want to bear children and guide the house, it's a badge of honor because that is what a woman should be seeking to do, right? Because this is the will of God. This, this means that you're a woman that wants to seek the will of God. You want to do what God has called a woman to do, and that is to marry and bear children and guide the house. Now, a lot of people, as soon as they hear this in our day and age, it's very uncomfortable because we live in a day and age where people do not value being married. You know, we live in a day and age where people do not value being a mother. People do not value having children. Instead, you know, we live in a day and age where people want to go work and they want to go have a career and be the president of the United States and following follow Hillary Clinton's footsteps, right? But this is the day and age we live in because they do not value these things. But this is not what God values. What God values is being a mother, being a wife and having children. You know, it always boggles my mind you know, even somebody who does want to do those things, that wants to work and have a career and all these things, because most of the time, women that go into the workforce and give up having children or put their children in daycare, they're usually working quite entry-level jobs. You know, a lot of the people that I know, like they're in, they're in customer service or an admin assistant, and you just think like, why, why would I leave looking after my children to go answer emails and answer phone calls? You know, they say like, you know, I, I, I want to get fulfilled. I want to, I want to be an independent woman and, and go out and work. And then, and then all that happens is they go and they sit in front of a computer all day and they do what I do, which is answer emails and answer phone calls. And the only reason why that, 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 that job gives me any reason is because I'm looking after my family. So like, why would a woman want to leave looking after the family to do what a man is doing only to do that to look after his family? You know? So... So not only that do, do, is, the, is uh, that, that mindset of, you know, why would you give up something much more valuable, which is taking care of children, having, having the freedom to go where you want, not having to clock in and clock out, put on a uniform, to go clock in and clock out, put on a uniform, and sit in front of a computer and answer phone calls and type emails. You know, like that, 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 you know my, my job is not as fulfilling as Elizabeth's job, but it's fulfilling because I do it because I'm trying to provide for my family. Not only that, you know, Jesus said, what shall profit a man if he gain the whole world but lose his own soul? So a soul is much more valuable than any riches that anybody could earn. And, you know, you say, oh, well, you know, they're not, no, my, my daughter or my wife, she's not, she's not just some entry-level person. She's a manager, she's a CEO, she's the president of the United States. It doesn't matter how much power or how much money you can gain, that position is not anywhere more valuable than being a mother. Because one of your children is more valuable than all the riches. You know, all the iPhones. It doesn't matter if you're the next Steve Jobs. All the iPhones and all the billions of dollars that you can make is not as valuable as one child that you're looking after. And that's why when you see this verse, don't think, oh, that's bondage. That's just men trying to oppress women and keep them in the home and, and get them to, you know, they don't want them to be anyone or anything. No, no, we want people to marry and bear children and guide the house because we want women to be something. We want them to be something of value. We want them to do the most important thing in their life, the most valuable thing in life, and that is to be a woman and a mother. So for a woman, you know, don't, don't get discouraged when people call you desperate or call you clucky because that, that's, that's what you should be doing, right? It's kind of like when somebody, you're a Christian and somebody calls you zealous or fanatic or crazy. You're like, good, because that means... <laughs> I'm different. I'm doing the right thing, right? I've been persecuted for the name of Christ. It's a badge of honor that you, that you should wear. <clears throat> so, ex you know, expose yourself to people. Let people know that, you're, that you want to be married, that you want to, uh, you know, have children. And let people know. And, you know, go along to social events. You know, get, 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 expose yourself, you know, uh, socially, right? <laughs> expose yourself socially. You know, not the wrong way, all right? Let people, let people hook you up with friends, you know? Don't be so proud to like, you know, not let people you know, say, hey, I know this guy, and go like, oh, you know, it's not, you know, just, just go along with it and, and go meet some people. You got, you got nothing to lose. <clears throat> so, you know, make it known that you're available. Second tip for the ladies, you know, don't lead the relationship. You know, don't, don't seek after a man and then, you know, always prompting him. You know, if you're the one always prompting him, you're the, always the one that wants to bring up the Bible, you're always the one that's calling him to go out, you're leading the relationship. Don't do that because that, 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 it's just unwise because you want to marry a leader. You want to marry a man that is taking charge. You don't want to be the mother of this man and marry somebody that you have to mother the rest of your life. 
you know, at the same time, you know, ladies, don't be too hard on guys. You know, it's hard enough as it is already when a guy has to approach a lady and face rejection. So don't be so hard on him. You know, don't, don't, you know, if a guy comes to you and he makes a fool of himself or whatever and, and he gets rejected, you know, don't go tell all your buddies and tell everyone and make fun of him and, and, and lower him in the, in the eyes of all your friends because he's had to open himself up to go and approach you and now you've just destroyed your brother in Christ in the eyes of all the other girls. So, you know, be loving. You wouldn't want somebody to tear you down after you've had a heartbreak. So don't tear uh, somebody else down. Uh, so number two, don't, don't lead the relationship. You know, make, you want to marry somebody uh, who's a leader, uh, not somebody who's a follower, or somebody that's complacent. Because if they're complacent when they're in love with you, how much more complacent are they going to be when, when you're married for four or five years, right? <clears throat> so just something to keep in mind. And what about else I got here first? Peter, three. All right, the last tip for, I've got for a woman is uh, here in 1 Peter 3, we'll just read first. Likewise, ye wives, be in, subject, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. While they behold your chaste conversation, coupled with fear, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid <coughs> with any amazement. And my last tip here just has to do with this verse. Now, a couple of things is, I just want to mention here. Now, it says here in um, verse 4, let it, oh, verse 3, whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on apparel. Now, I don't believe this verse is teaching that it's wrong to, um, you know, do up your hair or put on jewelry or, or, you know, wear nice clothing, right? What it's saying here is this is not what should adorn you. And what does it mean to adorn something? It means to make it beautiful. Right? Like a bride adorned for a husband. She's adorned on that day because she's, she's dulled up a bit, right? To, to be beautiful. But the Bible's saying here, like, don't let what is beautiful about you be the outward appearance. What's beautiful about you should be the inward appearance. And, uh, and ultimately, that is what makes a woman beautiful. Because you guys know, it doesn't matter how beautiful a girl is. If inside she's a terrible person, she's ugly. You know, I mean, it doesn't, doesn't matter how, how beautiful she is. And at the same token, even though you may not be a supermodel, if you have the inner man, that meek and quiet spirit, you will be, you will, ah, you will be more beautiful in the eyes of a spiritual man. So don't let that outward adorning be what makes you beautiful. Let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. Now, this is very important because... You know, the Bible saying here that you're beautiful and what, what should exemplify the, the beautiful hidden man is meekness and quietness. It's not saying meekness and silentness, right? So it doesn't mean that you're just this silent woman that walks 20 steps behind her husband, right? And you can't say anything, you have to talk from behind a curtain. Like in Islam, I think that's what they teach. Is that what they teach? I don't know, I'm making it up now. So it's saying here that what should exemplify a godly woman is you're meek and quiet. So what that means is if you're the loudest person in the room, you're probably not being that ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. So just keep that in mind. It doesn't mean that there are times where a woman can't be loud, right? But this is what should really identify you, is when people think of you, do they think of somebody that is boisterous or do they think of somebody that is meek and quiet? So the last tip is, you know, this, you know, the way... I believe you would win a husband over. Because the Bible's saying here that the husband can be won without any communication, just from the conversation of the wife, right? The lifestyle, the way that she lives. This is the way you ought to win a husband, right? It's, it's your conversation, your holy conversation and that hidden man of the heart, that inward beauty. Um, that's the way you should win them over. Because if you try and win a man over with the outward appearance, you win him over with the fancy hair and the makeup and the and and uh, you know the 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 clothing that is basically half naked. You're gonna win over the wrong type of men. And I, I don't know about for you guys, but for me, and you know maybe this is just me. But if if a woman is dressed inappropriately, 
I find it a lot harder to approach her because, you know, it's, it's just hard to look at her in the face. It's like, it's like when you go soul winning and a woman comes to the door and she's like half naked. You, you, you just, you're trying to give her the gospel, but she's like standing there half naked. And it's the, it's the same with you. If you dress inappropriately, often there are some guys that would approach you that may be too shy to because of the way you present yourself. So just keep that in mind. <clears throat> And that just be, might just be my own experience. Maybe, maybe some guys don't have a problem with that. I don't know. Uh, okay, so it's not wrong to do up your hair or wear jewellery. Just um, don't let that be what makes you attractive. And win him the same way that you would win a husband. All right, let's go back to Proverbs 18. Just go back to that verse. The Bible says here, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing, and obtaineth favour of the Lord. So notice that the verse does not say, whoso findeth the wife, findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord. Because there isn't only one wife for you. There isn't this, just this, the one that God has picked out for you. And we are like sort of on this pilgrimage journey, trying to identify who this woman is. So it doesn't say the wife, because there's more than, there's more than one option. And I want to give you a couple of thoughts just on, on this, uh, this concept of the one. That, you know, even if God had, and he doesn't, I don't believe this, but even if God had only one woman picked out for you, right, that you had to try and identify and marry, how would you even do it? How, how would you even identify this woman? Do you know what I mean? So, 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 we, so this person, this, these people believe that, you know, we have to try and find this, the one, but have no way of identifying it. Because cause let's go through the options, right? One, number one is you try and identify her using God's word. And don't get me wrong, and this is what I'm going to preach on in the next couple of weeks, is yes, we use Bible principles to try and help us decide who, the, who is the right and wrong person to marry, but the Bible does not specify individuals. So you're not going to read in the Bible, you know, Victor is to marry, you know, this person. Unless maybe you're Muhammad, right? I don't, I don't, know, I don't know the Quran, does, does it tell, you know, it says like, we gave, you know, Zaid's ex-wife, right? I'm just reading, I, I just, I'm just going to need to read this to you, because I, why well, you guys are here. I've been studying my Quran. <laughs> I need to read you guys this verse because this is the, the stupidest thing. Oh, where is it? Uh, 33, I think. You know, unless you're Muhammad, right? Maybe, maybe then your word says who you can marry and who you can't marry. Look at this. So basically, Zaid is a guy, is his adopted son, and then... Uh, he divorces his wife, and then Muhammad wants to marry uh, his adopted son's wife. Then look what it says here. This is Surah 33, so chapter 33, verse um, 37. Then when Zaid had dissolved his marriage, so he divorced his wife with her, we joined her in marriage to you, talking about Muhammad, right? In order that in future they may, there may be no difficulty to the believers in the matter of marriage, with the wives of their adopted sons, when the latter have dissolved their marriage with them, and Allah's command must be fulfilled. So the, the Quran is saying here that we gave Zaid's ex-wife to Muhammad so that there's no doubt, there's no question about whether or not it's right and wrong to marry your adopted son's ex-wife. So maybe if you read the Quran, and the Quran is your word of God, it does tell you. Muhammad's reading it and thinking, oh yeah, like it does tell me who I can and can't marry. But look at what it says here about Muhammad. This is, this is the same chapter i got to share this, guy, this with you. <laughs> Chapter 33, verse 50. It gives, it gives Muhammad more direction on who he can and can't marry. O oh, Prophet, verse 50. We have made lawful to you your wives, to you to whom you have paid their dowers, and to whom your right hand possesses out of the captives of war, whom Allah has assigned to you, and daughters of your paternal uncles and aunts, and daughters of your maternal uncles and aunts who migrated with you, and any believing woman who gives herself to the prophet, if the prophet wishes to wed her. This only for you, and not for the believers at large. So he's saying here that Muhammad can marry all these different people. He's not limited to four, right? And, 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 and he can marry whoever he wants. But you know what's funny? It's only reserved for him. Only Muhammad the prophet can do that, and nobody else. And you're telling me that this is the word of God. i, I just got to share one more verse with you, because I read this. This is the same chapter. I read, this is the stupidest thing I've ever read. And you just tell me if you think it's a stupid. Look at this. This is verse 53, uh, Surah 33. O you who believe, enter not the prophet's houses. So the prophet's houses, not the prophet's house. Enter not the prophet's houses 
until leave is given you for a meal. And then, not so early as to wait for its preparation, but when you are invited, enter, and when you have taken your meal, disperse, without seeking familiar talk. Such behavior annoys the Prophet. He is shy to dismiss you, but Allah is not shy to tell you the truth. And when you ask his ladies for anything you want, ask them from before a screen that makes for greater purity for your hearts and for theirs. Nor it is right for you that you should annoy Allah's messenger or that you should marry his widows after him at any time. Truly such a thing is in Allah's sight and enormity. Did you catch what that was saying? It's saying here, like when you enter, when you go to Muhammad's house, I'm going to show this verse to that guy today. Ashton, <laughs> I want to see what he says. But <laughs> you, do you hear what I say? He's saying, if you go to the prophet's house, you know, only go if you're invited for a meal. So don't go any other time. And, and don't go so early to wait for the meal. You need to just come when he invites you for that meal, when the meal is ready. But then it also says, but don't stay so long for chit chat because that annoys the prophet. But he's too shy to tell you that it annoys him. So Allah is going to tell you that it annoys him. And then the last thing it says here is, it says, you know, nor is it right for you that you should annoy Allah's messenger or that you should marry his widows after him at any time. Truly such a thing is in Allah's sight an enormity. So, so Muhammad, it's okay for him to marry Zaid's ex-wife. It's all, all right for him to marry wives that are divorced, but nobody can marry Muhammad's ex-wives. Even after he dies, no, nobody can touch his wives. And in fact, if you want to talk to them, talk from behind a screen, you know, to, to preserve your purity in theirs. Uh, anyways, I thought that was interesting. I just wanted to share that with you. All right. <clears throat> Let's go back onto your topic. So, you know, God's word, well, that's why I got into it. So God's word, it doesn't identify an individual. So the Bible doesn't tell you who to marry, right? And that's why, how could you know? How could you know that this is God's will for me to marry when the Bible doesn't even mention it, you know? So you could never have that assurance. So number one, you couldn't use God's word. Or number two, could you use your emotion? Because some people say, like, I know this is the one because I, would, I wouldn't feel this way otherwise. You know, and the, you know, when I'm around them, I've just swept off my feet and, you know, all this... You know, but, you know we, we know in Jeremiah 17 that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? So when it comes to deciding who to marry, your heart is the worst thing to use to, to determine who to marry and who isn't. So emotion, number two. Or well, number three, this, this is a big one, is circumstances, right? The circum they'll say like, you know, well, this is the one because this happened and this happened and this happened and it's just too coincidental that all these things could happen. <clears throat> Now the problem with circumstances is that, is that they're relative and they're subjective, right? It's like when you're trying to shop for a car, right? You're shopping for a car, you start noticing those cars on the street because that's what you're thinking about. You know, you want to you buy a phone and you start noticing, you know, you're thinking of switching to Samsung because you're sick of Apple and you start realizing, oh, you've got a Samsung too, you've got a Samsung, I'll show you. So you notice, oh man, everybody does have Samsung, not everyone has an iPhone. Because that's, because it's subjective and relative because you're noticing it, now it's going to be on your mind, you're going to notice it more. So, you know, it's, it, and, you know is, is God working through circumstances? Isn't he? Who knows, right? It's, not some, it's something that you have to believe. It's not something that you can prove. You can believe that God spoke to you and God is leading you and doing these things. And, and you know, rightly so, it can be. But it's something that we believe. It's something we take by faith. It's not something that we can just know because it's not in the Bible. And circumstances can be the opposite. It could be Satan also. It could be your own heart. It could be a lot of things. So that's why inevitably when it comes to circumstances, we need to use the word of God to cut out what circumstances would be the will of God and what are not. So it's something you have to believe. You cannot prove one way or another. Circumstances can be interpreted uh, in the direction that you already desire. It's relative and subjective. And you know, when I, when I think about circumstances um, leading to... Uh, Genesis 24. Leading to who you're going to marry. <clears throat> like, you know, people ask for a sign. They'll say, like, oh, this is the woman that I should marry. Then, you know, if I, if I send her a request on Facebook and she accepts my friend request, then maybe that's, that, that's the woman that I need to marry. You know, asking for a sign. When I think of these circumstances and signs that people, people uh, try and uh, believe, I always think of, of this passage, and maybe you're thinking of it too. You're saying, what about um, Isaac and Rebecca and, this, and Abraham's servant? You know, he went and he said, you know, if the lady does this, then I'll say that that's, that's the one, right? 
So let's just read through that passage and I'll give you some thoughts. Genesis 24. So the servant has now come to uh, this land to find a, a wife for Isaac. And he, and he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac. And thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. And it came to pass, before he had done speaking, that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any man known her. And she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hastened and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. And when she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hastened and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again unto the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the man, wondering at her, held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass as the camels had done drinking that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel of weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold and said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee. Is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said unto him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. She said moreover unto him, We have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge. And the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. So I would say this is the story that a lot of people will go to to say, you know, see, look, you know, you can ask for a sign and God will show you that sign and, and point you in the direction of the person that you are to marry. Now, a couple of things I just want to point out about this verse is number one, when the sign, I guess the, 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 he wasn't looking for a sign, I don't think. I think the servant was looking for an attribute, right, of a woman. Because he wasn't just giving some arbitrary sign like, oh, you know, if, if I'm standing here today at church and she walks past me and then that's a sign from God that that's the one I should marry. Or, you know, if God puts us in, into the same youth group or in the same classroom together, then that, that's, I'll take that as a sign from God that this is the girl I'm meant to marry. You know, this is just some arbitrary sign that doesn't mean anything. Whereas the sign he was looking for, he was looking for an attribute, right? He's saying, if I ask for a drink of water, what sort of woman is not just going to draw water for me, but also draw water for all my camels? So it's a, it's a woman that is not only hardworking, but she's considerate. And also, he didn't go and look for the women at, at, you know, at the nightclub in, in, the, in that place. He didn't go and look for the woman at the hairdressing salon. He went to look for the women at the well. So it's the women that are working hard, going and getting, get, you know, doing the housework and getting their jobs done. They're going down to the well to draw water. So, you know, you need to look for a girl in the right places as well. So he's looking for a girl in the right place. She's coming to do some work. She's hardworking. She's considerate. <clears throat> he's looking for an attribute. He's not just got some arbitrary sign. Now, the other thing is, in this situation, uh, point number two is, he's not the vested party, right? So the, the servant is not looking for a wife for himself. He's looking for a wife for his his master's son. So when he's asking this sign, there's no bias here. He's not, he's not asking for a sign, but he's the one looking for the wife. And this is where it's dangerous when you try and take this principle and say, well, I'm going to apply this sign and look for it. It's going to be, you know, you know it's, it's, you're just going to find those circumstances that are convenient because you're a vested party. You want to marry this girl and you're looking for signs that line up and, and it's just a dangerous way and not a wise way to do things. So it wasn't just like an arbitrary sign. Uh, I think he was looking for certain attributes. So people use, try and use God's word. People try and use emotion. People try and use circumstance. Another one I've heard is people try and use obedience. And they'll say that, um, you know, it was often told to me when I was going to a, a Presbyterian church, was saying, you know, the, the way you find your wife is if you're walking in the will of God, 
and you're obedient, God will direct your path and direct you to the woman you need to marry. <laughs> Where, you know, I would ask the question, or if that's the case, if, if the will of God is like a target that you have to hit, as opposed to what step you have to take day by day, which is what I believe obedience. Because obedience is, you know, what do I do today? Right? Do, do I do this or do that? What's the right step to take? And I take this step, right? And you have to decide because there could be multiple options. You know, like what church to go to. There can be multiple options. There can be this church, that church. We know God wants us in church, but which church you need to decide. God's, God's will and being obedient to God is not going to decide which church that you went to this morning. And it's the same. If the will of God is this target that you have to hit along the way, then the question is how obedient do you have to be to make sure that you're not going off the, off, astray off the path and to make sure that you hit the target. So if you have to be obedient all the way to lead you to your wife, then is anybody obedient enough to know for sure that God has led them to that person? And the other thing is, you know, like I said, obedience comes from the word of God, but it doesn't make decisions for you where there are multiple choices, you know? And in the case of finding who the wife is, there, there are multiple choices. So you're going to end up back at situation one to three, which is how do you then decide of these choices who is the right one to marry? So I don't think it's obedient. So it's not, you know, don't use, you won't be able to use God's word. Not that you don't use God's word. You just won't be able to identify an individual. Um, don't use emotion, don't use circumstances, and don't use obedience. Uh, because it's a choice that you have to make. There are several options. And it's, you know, it's a bit like, it's a bit like assurance of salvation. You know, there's, you know, there's no assurance apart from God's word. So if, uh, we only know that we're saved because God's word says if you believe on the Son, you have everlasting life. So if you try and use emotion to guide you as to who to marry, there's, there's no assurance there, right? Because it's no, there's nothing definite about emotion. There's nothing definite about circumstances. There's surely nothing definite about... There's, there's something definite about obedience that we're not obedient enough. So we need to do the best of our ability and trust that God's grace will help us with the rest. Um, but just like assurance of salvation, if you try and use these methods to determine who is the right one, then uh, it, it's, it's, uh, it's not going to give you assurance of choosing the right one. <clears throat> so what's the conclusion for today? The conclusion for today is that there isn't this just the one uh, of who you are to marry. The Bible says that we find a wife. It can be, it, there are multiple options out there. And the conclusion is that it's a choice. It's a choice you have to make. You have to decide who you want to marry and who you do not want to marry, who, who you're going to commit to um, and who you're going to serve with your life. And, and like who you're going to, for a lady, who you're willing to follow and submit your authority to because you're going to go from your father to your husband. So is this the man that you want to do this with? That's really just the, the question you want, want to ask. It's, it's the choice is up to you. The ball is in your court. Uh, but we will go over in the next couple of weeks what we should look for, because I do believe even though the choice is left up to us, God dis does give us uh, prerequisites and guidelines of what are the no-go zones, right? So I'll continue that next week and, and the week after. All right, so I hope that was interesting for you, this uh, sermon. It gives you a better idea uh, and, and as, we, as we build this foundation on this topic. All right, let's pray.